morning. Welcome to this circle. Welcome to Southminster Steinhauer United Church. We are grateful that you, you can hear me? Great. It's just me. I can't hear myself. Welcome to this circle. We are, as always, uh, enriched by each other in being here together and this circle changes week by week. Different people, newcomers, people that we haven't seen in a while, and people that hold this circle for us every week. We're grateful for each and every one of you, and grateful that we can be in a community where we can be just who we are, that we don't have to be this way or that, and we can be ourselves. And we hold this circle as a safer place to do that, to be ourselves, to explore the places that we need to explore and be the people and the community that we can be together. As we uh, honor uh, the land this morning, we recognize that it is in this time and place that we have a privilege of meeting here in this place that those who have come before us and those that are still in this room worked so hard to build community, to build this space, and we're grateful for it. And even before that, long, long before that, this land was here, home to many in Edmonton, and before that, before Edmonton was Edmonton, when the land was its own, and those who lived and dwelled on it and with it cared for it, and tended it. We recognize that we're on Treaty 6 territory, and all those who call themselves treaty holders and honor the treaty, we are grateful for. And even before that, before this land was Treaty 6, this land was here, cared for, tended by nature herself. And we give thanks that we can now enjoy it. of this beautiful land. Um, we have the privilege of uh, having another moment for stewardship, and it usually would occur a little bit later in our gathering, but we are going to... Uh
We've been gathering over the last uh, three or so weeks uh, since we uh, were together on the uh, November, on the October 14th weekend, where we unveiled the newest banner in our space, a banner that comes to us uh, through the legacy of Miwasan Valley United Church and whose values uh, in, in discussions with them uh, can live on as we gather together and know that we share uh, these values with them and with the world. Uh, today, we continue that series with our focusing on, on our being rooted in courage. This is uh, the day that in the Christian tradition gets celebrated as All Saints Sunday. And on that day, we honor those who have gone before us. Those that we know whose lights continue to shine in our lives. It's a difficult and challenging gathering for many of us because the names that we will read later on are familiar to many of us. But if they're not familiar and we're newer to this community, we recognize also the sheer weight of what a community can hold for each other. That we can hold space, hold compassion for those who are grieving and celebrate with them too in the ongoing light of life. And it's in that spirit that we light the candle today. The candle that will always be lit in our gatherings. The candle that reminds us that life and light were here long before us and will be here long after. And we have the gift, the privilege of being in light's presence within us, among us, between us. May this light continue to shine for us as we gather this morning. We can speak words together, words that center us, words that bring to us a sense of centeredness and, and strong-heartedness as we meet with one another. Let's speak these words uh, responsibly. We gather to listen beyond words for the rhythm of life's seasons. We gather to seek solace for losses that are heavy to bear. We gather to lean toward one another to share wisdom we've found to be true. We gather to place our gratitude to see beyond ourselves toward a hopeful future. We gather to stand shoulder to shoulder that no one stands alone. We gather mindful of the mystery of death and the gift of life to be inspired to live courageously in the present.
If anyone would like to join us for the time for all ages, please, you're welcome to come to the carpet, to listen from where you are. Does anyone know how to be brave? You do? What is a way to be brave? This is hard. I asked a hard question. Well, you know what, I'm going to read a book about that, so we don't have to answer that question right now. But I I, I will also ask you, how do you know if someone's strong on the outside? Are there signs that someone is really strong when you look at a person? Mm -hmm. They have muscles. muscles. (laughs) So you can tell someone's strong if they have muscles. How do you tell if someone's strong on the inside? Oh, that's another hard question. (laughs) It's harder to tell, isn't it? It's hard to tell if someone's strong on the inside. I think the only way we have to know if we're strong on the inside is by what words come out of us and what actions come out of us. It's the way we show that we're strong, with our words and with what we do. And that's what my story's about today. It's called courage. Courage is just another word for being brave. And uh, here's lots of ways Uh, This is Courage by Bernard Weber. There are many kinds of courage. There's awesome kinds. And there's everyday kinds. Still, courage is courage, whatever kind. Courage is riding your bike for the first time without training wheels. Ooh, that's scary at first. You have to be brave to do that. Courage is a spelling bee, and your word is superciliousness. (laughs) That's a big, long word to spell. Courage is having two chocolate bars and saving one for tomorrow. (laughs) Ooh, this is a good week to talk about that. Courage is that it's your job to check out night noises in the house. ay ay ay. Courage is being the new kid on the block and saying right away, Hi, my name's Chris, what's yours? Ooh, that can be scary. Courage is tasting the vegetable before making a face. Courage is not peeking at the last pages of your whodunit book to find out who did it. Courage is being the first to make up after an argument. Courage is deliberately stepping on sidewalk cracks. (laughs) Courage is being sudsed and scrubbed by strangers. Courage is breaking bad habits. Courage is suddenly remembering a silly joke and trying not to giggle when everyone else is being especially serious. Courage is deciding to have your hair cut. Courage is trying to cover up your mean, jealous side. Courage is a scenic car trip and being stuck in the middle during the best part. Courage is explaining the rip in your brand new pants. Courage is going on it again and again. And courage is if you knew where there were some mountains, you would definitely climb them. Courage is exploring heights and depths. 
Courage is a blade of grass breaking through the icy snow. Courage is starting over. Oh yeah, look, that sandcastle got stepped on. Courage is holding on to your dream. Courage is sometimes having to say goodbye. Courage is what we give to each other. That's again. There are so many ways to have courage and to be brave. And we can't show it with muscles or with our hair or our clothes. We have to show it with our words and with the things we do. And we're all working on it. Whether we're grown-ups or kids, we're all working on being braver by doing all those amazing things. So, does it take courage to go to Kids Spirit or preschool or youth cafe? Sometimes. Sometimes it does, if you don't know what to expect or what's going to happen. So, let's all, with courage, do what we're going to do today. First of all, uh, Janet and Pam for... Uh, what they're about to do. Uh, they're about to play a piece uh, written over the course of the last two years. I can't say two years ago because it keeps getting these little adjustments, but um, thank you to Pam and Janet for, for playing uh, this piece called Candle and Feather, duo for cello and piano. This is a new piece uh, I wrote uh, because it was commissioned by Lyle and Donna. Uh, it was commissioned at uh, an auction about two years ago uh, to this date. And, uh, and we celebrate that, uh, that, that it was played about, uh, at, well, at the beginning of September at the gathering that they host uh, to celebrate life and death for families and caregivers grieving the death of a child. And uh, it, it seemed appropriate to play on this day when, when we're also celebrating life and death and, and all of the wonders and mysteries in between. And so, um, thank you, Janet and Pam, and uh, here is Candle and Feather.
reading from Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. Jesus insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go ahead to the other side. He climbed the mountain so he could be by himself and pray. He stayed there alone late into the night. Meanwhile, the boat was far out to sea when the wind came up against them and they were battered by the waves. Early in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. They were scared out of their wits. A ghost, they said, crying out in terror. But Jesus was quick to comfort them. Have courage. Don't be afraid. Peter, suddenly bold, said, Master, if it's really you, Call me to come to you on the water. He said, come ahead. Jumping out of the boat, Peter walked on the water to Jesus. But when he looked down at the waves churning beneath his feet, he lost his nerve and started to sink. He cried, Master, save me. Jesus didn't hesitate. He reached down and grabbed his hand. Then he said, You're faint-hearted. What got into you? The two of them climbed into the boat, and the wind died down, and all who saw it were amazed. This is a story passed down from the first century Jesus tradition. May we find this. I think perhaps it takes courage. If you know what the first Sunday in November is all about in this community, it takes courage to get out of bed and come. If you don't, surprise, but if, if you do, uh, it is a difficult day because, not only because we're remembering those who have, who have died in our lives and those who have, whose lights continue to shine, but because... It's a time to talk about death. And we don't often, in our lives, in our world, our culture doesn't allow us many chances to talk about death in a real, good, honest, deep way. Our culture is fairly death-averse. We will pay oodles and oodles of money for people to deal with all of those death details for us. We will do anything to avoid the conversations, to deny that death will ever touch us. And yet, there comes a time in our lives when we recognize that it's on the horizon for all of us. And that talking about it, planning for it, becoming friends with our deaths, becomes a necessity. So the story we read today from the Jesus tradition has been called a miracle story. It's probably the miracle story. You know, when, when you're thinking miracle stories, most people think, oh, you know, the walking on the water thing. That's one of the big ones. Now, as usual, I, I love talking about these stories, but I'll give my typical disclaimer when we talk about these stories because it's so important for us to know that we should never read these kinds of stories as if they're about the miracle, as if they're history of something that actually happened, as if they are something we have to wrap our minds around to understand rationally. 
these are spiritual stories. They're not meant for us to understand those rationally or in, in ways that actually happened. They're very seldom, these stories, about the act that we call a miracle. Why are these stories passed down to us? Because they're about us. This story is about Peter. And it's about each and every one of us. It's just like superhero movies aren't really about the otherworldly superpowers of the hero. They're about what's going on inside of them. It's about what's going on here in Peter's heart, what's going on in our hearts. Peter is faced with a challenge in this uh, story. Well, multiple challenges. They're in a boat and there's a storm. That's challenge number one. That goes without saying. But... Um, but Peter, Peter was all bravado. Uh, Peter had been listening to Jesus teach for a long, long time. Uh, he'd been hear, hearing him talk about the rising of storms in life, and he'd been talking about uh, building community and compassion. He'd been talking about the difference or the lack of difference between an insider and outsider, that there was none. He saw firsthand this spiritual connectedness that his teacher exhibited in his life through the words that came out of his mouth and the actions that he, that he was about. And he saw that and he wanted it. And in this story, we get the exact kind of uh, embodiment of that want. Jesus is there doing something again, calm and beautifully, beautiful and connected in walking on water, and Peter wants it. Peter wants the kind of life that Jesus has been talking about. And so when he sees Jesus do that, he asks him, well, can, can I do it? Can I do it? Can I do that? So with the instruction not to be afraid, he steps out of the boat. And what do you know? He starts doing it. Uh, he starts walking on the water. He starts doing what he needs to do to overcome the brutal waves, to rise above whatever's going on, and to see above them. You can see how these stories are full of metaphor and meaning that aren't anything about real waves. They're all about seeing above the challenge not being buried and swamped and drowned by the crud of life. But then, oh dear, then uh, Peter's heart betrays him. And he looks down. He looks down at the rolling, storming water underneath him, and when he sees just how real his situation is, he loses his nerve, and he starts to get pulled under and overwhelmed by his reality and recognizes he needs help. And he gets it. And once safe in the boat, uh, Jesus turns to him and says, you're faint-hearted. What happened? What is going on? And that's the question for us all. When we're in the middle of life storms, it's our hearts that we need to be strong. Not our rowing muscles, not our swimming, but our hearts. Because the boat, we can never count on it. We can't count on the boat. Uh, the wind to blow in the right direction, unreliable. We only have our heart to be strong-hearted in the face of challenge and adversity. Now, um, Peter's a great teacher in this story because he's all of us that lose our nerve when the waves are threatening to come over our head. When we allow our courage to drain in the moments we need the most. Just, just, when, just when that word that we want to speak in a conversation that, that could be the word that, that, that shows just exactly what we believe and who we are, 
when we lose our nerve right before we speak it? We've all been there. When there's something we need to do and we don't do it. We've all been there. But what Peter does is he gets out of that boat and that's a big deal. We all find ways to get out of the boat. To just have that courage and to do what needs to be done and say what needs to be said, to find our way to just pluck up our courage. Getting out of the boat is a big, big deal. So Andre Gide once said, he's an author, he once said, uh, one can't discover new oceans unless they have the courage to lose sight of the shore. Um, another version of this, uh, Indiana Jones. You know that great uh, historical figure, Indiana Jones. Steven Spielberg's archaeologist who never went searching for adventure but always seemed to find it. Um, he has this quote in one of his films, you know, Indiana Jones is, is you know, there's big boulders chasing after him, there's, there's, there, there's tons of things happening with Indiana Jones, the, the whole Nazi regime is after him at one point, but um, he has this quote in one of his films and he's not doing anything daring uh, it's not when he's performing some daring escape, but it's when he's teaching a class. And uh, with a wink to us, the audience, because we know he's always uh, finding himself in these crazy adventures, we find himself saying this, if we have sound. Archaeology is the search for fact, not truth. If it's truth you're interested in, Dr. Tyree's philosophy class is right down the hall. <laughs> so forget any ideas you've got about lost cities, exotic travel, and digging up the world. We do not follow maps to buried treasure, and X never, ever marks this spot. Right. Uh, that's ironic because Indy's always following maps. But... There's a little, there's a little uh, bit of uh, Peter in Indiana Jones because um, Indy embodies the notion that it's more about the adventure and the journey than the artifact. Indy's losing out on artifacts all the time to maybe his rival or, or to the enemy or whomever. The artifact is often not his in the end, but it's this daring journey he's on to find it. And... Um, it's true that we do have to, at times, a lot of times, look up from our maps, knowing that someone else has made them, they're not ours. That they might be someone's way to a treasure, but they may not be our way. So getting out of the boat or looking up from the map, because X doesn't always mark the spot. That's the courage we need to sometimes step off the beaten track and find the real treasure of life. It's usually just a few degrees off center, the treasure we find when we're not looking for it or when we're totally off course. And getting out of the boat is that willingness to surround ourselves with a spirit of Finding what we need, even though we've got no map to get there. Grief is kind of like that. There are no road maps. Uh, we can make a map of our grief, and we could all do that, and they'd all be different. Uh, we could try to follow someone else's map of grief, and it would not show us the way because it's not ours. Facing grief and death requires courage. Uh, as our book study leaders presented on Monday evening, uh, Catherine Osmond gives us advice. Well, she gives a lot of advice, but this is one particular piece of advice that she gives.
to realize that death gives life urgency and makes each moment matter more. To acknowledge our own deaths, the reality of it, makes life more urgent and makes each moment matter more. We can soothe the fears we have around death through our acknowledgement and acceptance, through our own rituals and through knowing that our mortality is what makes life sweet. Today is one of those rituals to make us keenly aware of mortality, our own, that of others, of the preciousness of our time together, and hopefully not a morbid, more, not a morbid, I can't say that word. Morbid, morbid thank you. <laughs> Sometimes it just takes courage to open your mouth. <laughs> well, what I was trying to say was just to, to, be, to, to have an honesty about our limited time and to cherish our days. This is the kind of courage that we're rooted in, that if we can talk about it, we can see it. And if we can see it, we can begin to see above the waves of it. We can begin to say to our culture, to our world, I don't need to be scared of having these conversations. I don't have to be scared to face the difficult issues, topics, and plans in the realities of my life and my death, but I can deal with them with compassion and strength. We'll do that every time we face one of life's storms with one another. That's that's the message of Peter in this story, that we'll do it each time. And, and if we begin to think that we can have and reach out our hand for another, that we're not doing this alone. We'll do it each time we lose our nerve and call upon another to just lift us up a little bit so we can see above the waves again. And we can call upon the great strength and legacy of love and heart that we have in this room that we have in our families and communities, the lights that will continue to shine in our light in so many different ways. And so we'll work to make it so with courage, with strong hearts. May it be so.
So we gather together in prayer our intentions for this morning, for this day, for this All Saints Sunday. In the miracle and mystery in which we live, we are seized with wonder that we are born of the stuff of the stars. We're amazed that we're part of a long history of the cosmos that has both burst and evolved into reality. How great that we are stirred as a species to stories and songs and that a spirit of resilience lives within us as we help each other heal our hurts, remember with gratitude, and go about the difficult work of transforming anguish into wisdom, pain into beauty, failure into freedom, guilt into understanding. Once again, we affirm that the earth is our cradle, our ground, and our home. The sky is our blanket, protective and warm. The creatures of land, swimmers of sea, birds of the air, green plants and trees, all are our siblings. As our ancient atoms are arranged and reformed, we honor that we all take our turn in this form, in these bodies, but ultimately will be rearranged again as our substance is returned to our elemental birthplace. Our significance in the cosmos will continue. For those who have died before us, we grieve, and yet they live on in our hearts, our actions, our memories. We now remember these beloved ones of our community with deep gratitude. After each series of names is read, a candle will be lit, and the reader will say, you who lit the path before us, and all respond, we receive your light. Louise Adams, Ronald Adams, Wendy Adams, Lorne Allen, Bertha Ayers, Brian Barkwell, Kevin Barkwell, Rick Barkwell, Annie Braun, Henry Braun, Marge Blaney, Christian Brown, Alvin Buckles, Mona Buckles, Ed Condrot, Sharon Costal, Janice Kramer, Dave Cranston, Jane Cumming, Cameron Cunningham, Joan Day, you who light the path before us, we receive your light. Dennis Dubay. Wayne Aker, Grace Elwell, Diane. Into this moment, we speak simultaneously the names that have not yet been spoken into this circle but we hold in our memory and carry in the fabric of life.
in the shadows of all that has gone before us, may we remember that lights continue to burn. The significance of all who have died continue as their indestructible atoms take their next turn in the cosmos. May the legacy of life burn fully and faithfully all the days of our lives. May it be so. Amen. We meet around this table and we remember the empty places. We cherish the memory of those we are missing. We remember also those who are seeking a place at the table, seeking to be included, seeking a voice and a presence at the tables where decisions are made. And we remember those who struggle to abolish the segregation of our tables, the places of discrimination and diminishment, so that all might belong and all might take their place. As we meet around this table, we do so in a way that has been done for generations. We remember stories by wisdom teachers near and far, including Jesus of Nazareth, that offered visions of radical inclusion. Ones who shared a table with those without a seat, without a voice, without a second thought. And so our tables must do the same. So then we can also share bread in a commitment to those who are hungry for food and shelter, for love and equality, for justice and peace. May the bread deepen our courage to live honestly, to live justly, to live courageously. And so then, can we also share a cup? A cup of commitment to community. Our global village, our common humanity, and all the places where we live out our connection to all. As we share this table and these everyday symbols of a good earth, may we strengthen our resolve to share extravagantly, care compassionately, love deeply, 
and live fully. We are all welcome at this table. You need not be a member of this church or any church to participate in this ritual. We're united in our common humanity and in our hunger for the bread of courage and the cup of community wherever we might find it. Come as you are. You're welcome to come and participate by sharing bread and dipping it in the cup. You're also welcome to participate in this ritual by holding the space and remaining in your seat in whatever way you're comfortable in being part of this time. You are welcome. So the table is set. Let's come. Our lights, they change. They take different forms. They infuse the room differently with light. Some still shine. Some have been changed. But light, they remain. And so we go into this week and into our time, strengthened with words of courage that we do not go alone. We go with each other and for each other. May we go in the strength of our hearts.